Hi, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ian Dolphin, Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation. Uh, Aperio, with its partner ASAP in France, is a network of around 180 higher ed institutions and commercial partners, which work together to create and sustain software to support the academic mission. Uh, today's webinar highlights the work of the Student Success Plan project, which aims to promote effective intervention to support student retention. In a moment, I'm going to pass you on to Russ, the project lead, who will give you some background on the project and a status update. But uh, before I do, remember to uh, post any questions in the chat window uh, as we go along, because it makes it easier to kind of recap at the, at the end. So thanks very much for attending, and I will hand you over to Russ. Well, thanks for attending, folks. This is uh, Russ Little. I'm a Chief Innovation Officer at the PAR framework and formerly of Sinclair Community College, which is where Student Success Plan originated. So I'd uh, like to take you through a little bit about what Student Success Plan is and, and why it was created, and then talk about some of the uh, exciting new features that we're uh, releasing in the very short future. So SSP is a holistic case management system designed, uh, as Ian said, around persistence, retention, completion. Really, how do we get more students to be successful in higher education? So it includes case management, academic advising tools, the ability to do early alerts. It has a student self-help interface and, of course, the ability to report and pull data back out, which might be the most critical aspect of any of these systems. Are the interventions we're making working? Did we? have the impact we expected to have when we spent our scarce resources to assist students. So why are these things important at this time? I, I think nationally, at least here in the States, um, there's a growing emphasis on success, completion, and a tide of funding. And that begins to become a, a much larger conversation politically and with uh, declining state revenue budgets, et cetera. And in most institutions, managing student success or retention efforts is kind of scattershot and then many silos, and having a single system to tie that all together becomes very important. I mentioned measurement. Higher ed has historically not done a, a great job of measuring intervention success, and at most we typically do it many terms after that has completed, so we're doing more of a postmortem instead of looking at things as they happen. And most importantly for the Aperio Foundation, we're looking for collaboration and development and deployment, shared practices, creating a community around the student success plan so that we can assist one another to help our students. So uh, SSP is what we consider an IPASS system, and this is a term that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation coined, and EDUCAUSE uh, has grabbed onto and, and really done a lot with. So it's I'm going to use this term, IPASS, to describe SSP because this is kind of how the, the language is forming up in the community. So integrated planning and advising systems or services. And it's uh, really just what I already described, a holistic approach to wrapping your arms around the student to make sure they get all the services and resources they need, both academic and non-cognitive, kind of in one platform. So some work I had uh, been a party to with EDUCAUSE, and, and we were looking at and uh, interviewing dozens of schools and their chief in, uh, information officers and chief success officers and uh, getting survey data out there. So most or many students that enter uh, secondary education don't, uh, or post-secondary education, don't necessarily finish a degree within six years. I mean, that number, 42%, is, is pretty scary, and we know that these are huge challenges and issues, and it varies, of course, between community colleges and universities and private and public, et cetera, but we all have challenges around student success and retention. Uh, out of all the people we talked to, which was kind of amazing, none said that IPES technology use would decrease, and almost everybody said it would increase and that they saw increasing budgets and increasing resources needed to be put in this area. So a little bit about the kind of ecosystem. If you think about, you know, you hear a lot of buzzwords, learner analytics and early alert and all of those things. So this is kind of how I visualize the uh, IPASS ecosystem with holistic case management kind of in the center. And with SSP being able to do the early alert, the student self-help, the holistic case management, the prescriptive advising, the intrusive interventions, and the measurement and reporting. So why use it? Um, I've already talked about a lot of these things, but some of them uh, implement systematic processes. How do we know that everybody's doing the same thing with students at West Campus, North Campus, South Campus? Um, 
how do we know that they're getting the, the, the best referrals? Do we have a common source or a knowledge base of all the supports and referrals at our institution? Is everybody uh, drawing from the same pool? You know, if somebody's already figured out how to get child care for a student in the evening or for a child with disabilities or to deal with test anxiety, et cetera, all of the coaches and advisors should have access to that. And the students should have access to that in a self-help format instead of everybody recreating that wheel. How can we break down silos? How do we make sure that financial aid and uh, student services and as well as academic advising are all playing off the same playbook and uh, all supporting the student to be successful? And as the name implies with Student Success Plan, how can we create a clear plan of action for the student, both academically and kind of as a, a checklist? You need to do these three, three, four, five things to be successful in college and that we can track their progress, as well as making sure they get to the right classes to complete their credentials. So Dr. McClenney uh, down at UT Austin is, is fond of saying students don't do optional. And so you'll see that throughout SSP is that it's a bit of structure. It isn't meant to be draconian and, and force them to do things, but to provide uh, pathways or default patterns that lead to success. So how does the whole thing work? Uh, students are identified, and you can use all sorts of different models to identify students, and I'll show you some of them in SSP. Um, then we apply the coaching or case management. Uh, you have your dashboards. You're going to see alerts and, and the ability to bring in predictions. You can journal your interactions with those students, see a history of whoever's interacted with that student, create individual plans of action uh, and academic plans. On the intervention side, we're going to have the ability for early alert to come from systems or processes through the API or from faculty members in their courses to let us know that a student might need assistance. We're going to see the student intake and how a student can tell us more about what's going on in their life so we can assist them further. And then we're going to be able to push those back out to students to make sure that information is where they need it to be. So does all of this work? It's, it's easy to say all of these things and say that this is a, a, an important thing that we should be doing. I've been working on this system since uh, 2002. And over that time, we've, we've got pretty good longitudinal data at Sinclair. And... Um, Got some feedback, so I'll, I'll give you these numbers, but students are more likely to be successful, more likely to be retained, and more likely to graduate. Now, with that said, the technology is not magic. The people are magic. The technology is supportive of those people. So the real magic happens between a faculty member and a student or an advisor or a coach or a mentor and a student. The technology allows us to scale and have many more relationships and do it in a more robust way and a coordinated way. So instead of spending all of our time trying to redo what somebody else did where we're not in sync with one another, we can actually advise and counsel more students. So the, the group I'll share data with you about is called Pathways to Completion, and they are the first time in college at-risk students, so typically uh, not academically prepared, multiple dev ed courses, uh, or in poverty, and we identify them at admission, and we give them to a student success coach. And so that before they register the first time, they're beginning this process of uh, mentoring and coaching, advising, and we track all of that within the student success plan, and we use those tools to both uh, grab additional information from the student through the student intake, as well as then creating their academic plan and making sure that the faculty let us know if these students stumble. So some example outcomes. So on the left are the students in Pathways to Completion who participate, and, and that's a, an important characteristic because that's a big number there. But students who actively participate, and, and we know from involvement theory and all sorts of other research that's been done for decades, that students who are engaged with uh, those at the institution are much more likely to be successful. I think the important piece here with SSP is the ability to actually measure that and then tie in things like ROI and know what kinds of impacts we're having and being able to go back and relate the amount of staffing we have to the amount of retention we've generated so that we can start looking at it instead of it being the, just the right thing to do, it also becomes the right fiscal thing to do uh, as we look at retention numbers and tuition and funding. So you can see that they've done much better than those who are just uh, normally attending college that were not at risk. Probably even more surprising is that when we look at year to year, they are much higher than just the non-at-risk students and those that did not participate, meaning that they were in those risk categories but decided not to take our services, the, the gap is quite profound. 
So the other thing is, is that this even has a, almost a disproportionate effect on minority students in the sense that they have even greater successes in many ways, uh, particularly in retention. Uh, one of the things that makes us excited to, to want to continue to do this work after years and years is that we are really seeing impact in terms of graduation and the value that these students will have for a lifetime. And while at a community college, six years to graduate is not um, fantastic, <laughs> it is not that far from average. And this still does represent those students who did not spend three, four, five years at the institution and then leave with nothing. They did actually finally finish that credential because of the ability to manage them from a, a holistic perspective and that it's, it's a fairly profound effect again. So one of the things that we're really excited about with SSP uh, currently is the ability to bring in analytics and alerts from other systems to be able to get those in the hands of those that, that work with the student. And we can tag students in cohorts or demographics or who the students are. If they wear blue hats, we could tag them as blue hat students. We can use their placement scores. We can use analytics. We can use predictive analytics. We could use um, high school GPAs and a, and a bunch of other things to be able to color code and create dashboards for the, the advisor, coach, faculty member, so that they have a better understanding of the student and the level of risk they're dealing with. Um, and then the early alerts we can do through uh, events and triggers through the API. Uh, SSP has a very robust API with um, fairly extensive documentation for almost every feature in the system. So this is an example of the, the new dashboard. And this is a, a view of SSP 2.6 that I actually pulled off of our continuous integration server this morning. So this is not vaporware. It should be released in very short order. It's in final test now. Um, on the left, you're seeing a list of all of the students on your caseload, and you can see that they're color-coded. So students who have an early alert or uh, have need of an intervention are a different color. And then as you select students, you get information out to the right. So you have a, a list of tools there in the vertical column in the center, and you can see that this is a, a student isn't selected. We're looking at the main tool, and so this would be the default dashboard that comes up. I don't know if you can read all of the uh, the letters because of the sizing on the on the webcast, but we're seeing information about this student, their status, what program of study they're in, what plan they're on, um, what service reasons, service groups, and referrals. And again, that would be the things like, is this a student that's first generation or a student with a blue hat or a, a student living in a specific uh, on or off campus or in a specific uh, uh, dorm or on a sports team or part of the Appalachian community or the African-American community or whatever target populations that you might later need to be able to report on and to segment the population on so that you might want to know how well are my students uh, that were first time, first generation Appalachian with um, GPAs above 2.0, et cetera, so that we can do a lot of demographic slicing and dicing. And then also look at the interventions we offered each of those types of groups and see what kind of impacts we've had. So this piece out here in the middle that we're excited about is the color coding. So each one of these different uh, blocks, so we've got uh, student or, uh, indicators, um, risk indicators, and uh, Sorry, I can't hardly read it now. You make it a little bigger. The intervention, the student indicators, and the risk indicators. And, and these are, like I said, pretty much brand new. We, previously, we had some of this stuff, but it was more textual-based, and we've gone to these glyphs. We tried um, some icon kind of things, but for 508 compliance, we've gone back to this kind of color coding within the boxes, uh, and we think it works pretty well. So we've got these different areas. And you can set up through the administrative tool. At what point does a GPA go from red, yellow, green based on the values or from the registration status or their academic standing, their completion rate, satisfactory academic progress, restrictions, et cetera. So it's using data that we were already bringing into SSP, but then allowing the individual uh, adopters to decide what levels those things are important to them. Since we all know we operate on different uh, values and, and as far as what we consider to be risk. Um, then things like the intake, is it done or not? How many open early alerts are there? Do they have open task items? Are they on or off their academic plan? And then out to the right are the other risk indicators, things like placement scores, 
uh, predictive analytics scores or any other kind of trigger that you might have inside your system that you want to be able to get in front of a coach or an advisor that you can bring in through our, um, our data integration process and then assign a value to. So if you have a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 50 or whatever it might be for a certain kind of risk, we can bring that forward, give it a label, and then determine if it should be presented to the advisor coach as red, yellow, or green based on your processes and rules, and then they'll have that information in front of them in a kind of easy di di digest way. So with this minor change, we also um, – added some new tabs. And so across the top there, I, I expanded it to make it a little easier to see. This also happens in the application so that it gets brighter. No audio. Neil, can you hear me okay now? Can anyone else hear me? Okay. Well, Neil, I, I hope you can get your audio to work, but I guess we're going to go on since Dennis and Ian can hear me. Um, so across the top, you've got dashboard, details, financial, transcript, placement, contact, coach, and students. And all of those tabs are basically just surfacing information about the student in an easy-to-get-to to way. So the dashboard, again, is this first page. It's kind of... Can we see just visually how much is yellow, red, and green? Uh, who are these students? What special service groups are they in? Um, are they on or off their academic plan? Just really quick hit kind of stuff. And as we would drill in a little deeper under details, we would see more information, and, and there will be some more screens about that as we go forward. Was there a question? So one of the other ways we get information into the system is through early alert. And SSP has been um, integrated into Sakai and uh, Moodle and Angel and a couple other packages, as well as now supporting a, a full LTI integration. And I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But we can go directly off of something like the roster or the gradebook and be able to have a, a faculty member send an early alert to let us know that a student might need uh, additional assistance. And so for them... We also have a standalone tool, so it doesn't have to be integrated, and that ships with the, uh, the open source system as it is. And they can select the student. They select the reasons. Um, they make some suggestions, and those things are all configurable for you, so you can use them to meet your business process needs. And then you can also set up some routing rules. So for this specific reason on this campus, this alert should route to a specific office or a specific person. Uh, so that that way you can send attendance issues to one office and send personal concern issues to a different office and tutoring to yet another so that we can break up the work and put them in the right places and get them to the right kind of services they need. So now we've, we've seen some ways to look at students and that we've got a lot of information about them. We can get in, we can see their risk factors, we can look at their details, their financial information, their transcripts, placement scores, schedules, all those kinds of things. But what are we going to do with all of that? So SSP is really set up to do kind of case management. And so uh, more than just being the surfacing of the information, we want to be able to drill down and use that information. And here are some of those screenshots uh, for details so we can see more information about a student, uh, their accumulation of, of credits and GPA by term and progress over time, their progress, uh, who specifically last created their academic plan, et cetera. You can also see a lot of more information about financial aid. We can see whether or not they have financial aid files missing, uh, if they've accepted their awards, how many terms uh, the awards have been there, if they're on SAP, what the reasons are, uh, what their statuses are, et cetera, as well as seeing normal views of transcript, placement, uh, and their course schedules. So other ways to find students in the system so that you can work with them, uh, on the left we have what's called the watch list, which is new in um, SSP 2.6, which is the ability to, you, you have students on your caseload, but now you may also have a secondary caseload called the watch list. And this is a, a non-exclusive thing. So if you if you say uh, in an office and you're interested in these students, but you're not necessarily responsible for them, you can add them to your watch list and be notified when things uh, happen with those students, but not necessarily be their assigned advisor or coach. On the right, we've increased the uh, number of pivots and things in the search fields 
uh, quite greatly in the 2.5 release and 2.6 refines it a little bit uh, to be able to search on um, a number of things, including their program statuses, their special service groups, their start terms, their majors, uh, their coaches, their early alert statuses, their academic plan statuses, as well as within uh, credit hour ranges and GPA ranges. So in this case, we're looking for uh, the students in distance learning in chemistry that have open early alerts with between 15 and 45 credit hours. Uh, and these can be used to find students to, and be able to work with them uh, and take action on their records. So another new thing for 2.6 is the ability then to do a bulk action instead of working with this student one at a time. I can export all these outputs from that, that uh, search field so I can find very targeted specific groups and I can export that to do something with it. I can send an email to all of those students. I can change the statuses of all those students. I can decide to watch those students or unwatch those students all in one action, where in 2.5 you had to do those kind of as an individual thing. So now you could find... Uh, show me all of my students who are within 15 credit hours of graduation in nursing with a 3.5 or above, and I wanted to let them all know about a special scholarship opportunity or a specific internship or something of that nature uh, or whatever you might imagine, and being able to get to those groups but then take a tactical action immediately. There's also the ability to send email to a student directly from the interface. In 2.6, this screenshot's actually from 2.5, but in 2.6, we've also added some formatting and spell checking in the uh, body of the, the email message. This also becomes part of the student record, so it'll journal it if you would uh, ask it to. It's got a little checkbox there so that uh, you have a record of it having been sent so that you say, you know, Bob, I really like to see you, blah, blah, blah. Then you can make sure that that gets recorded as part of the student record. The coaching history allows us to see everything that was done with the student and who it was done by, as well as an overview of things like GPA and academic standing and progress, et cetera. We can see action plan items. We can see early alerts. We can see journal entries, et cetera. So this is a way to get an overview of the student in a single uh, click instead of having to go detail in and out of a bunch of different records. When we started talking to advisors and coaches about what they were frustrated about, they did not like to have to log into multiple systems and have multiple passwords, and they didn't like to have to go into multiple screens to find the one piece of information they needed. So there have been some studies done that advisors and coaches often spend more than half of the session hunting for data uh, and not advising. So they're turned away from the student on a computer looking for some piece of information that they need to be effective, and we were trying to figure out ways we could, we could uh, speed that up for them or make the, the process less painful so that they could spend more time coaching and advising students and less time hunting. So the student intake allows us to, to pick up a lot of data that your registrars typically do not. Things like, are you first generation? How sure are you about your major? What do you really want to do? Um, how do you think you're going to pay for college? What challenges do you think you have? So that when we meet with the student, we can have a deeper connection quicker. This can be sent to them as an email, and they fill it out secure online through the, the interface, and they can let us know about their, their situation and what's going on in their life. Are they Do they have kids? What shift do they work? How many hours do they have to work, and how many hours a week do they have to study, et cetera, so that at that first meeting, we can spend more time advising and coaching and less time doing information discovery. So if they've let us know that transportation and childcare are challenges for them, in that first meeting I can try to have solutions available instead of learning about them and then saying, well, come back next Tuesday and I'll have some things for you when you get here. So other things we might want to do, we want to, we want to record our interactions with students. And as an institution, this is important to us to know who told the student what or what processes or where are they at in a process. So we've created something here we, we call Speed Notes, which allows you to pre-build tracks, steps, and details for recording. So if you think about this as a journal, like any other customer relationship management system, it records who put it in. We can set different confidentiality levels, so only the people with the right permissions can read these comments. And if we see here, this one is selected for distance learning, and then there can be that it would be a track. And then each of those folders is a step. And then within those are the details. And this is all administratively configurable. You don't need IT. So that they can just go in and check the boxes instead of having to type in comments. Now, of course, we don't want to limit them. And out on the left, you can see 
They do have the ability to type in comments. And new for 2.6 is the ability to do some uh, low-level formatting and conditionals, and probably the spell check will make it in as well so that we can get those into the notes. This has really sped things up. A lot of people feel like electronic uh, record keeping is a, a burden to them. And so this has allowed us to pre-build and pre-fill for specific processes. Uh, advising visit one, it's the same eight or nine things they do every time. And so when they click the track advising, uh, the step, visit one, and then they have the eight or nine checkboxes, and they go check, 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 save, and they're done with their journal entry instead of having to spend all that time typing. It also has a tremendous benefit on the reporting side is that it's much easier to connect and report that back out than it is to look at the uh, freeform text. So the journaling is more for us. How do we keep records about what we've done with a student? The action plan is really about how do we tell the student what they need to do to be successful. And so the action plan, you can think of it as like a to-do list or a task list. And we try to, to come up with ways to help them reach their goals or overcome their challenges. So there is this giant reference guide. And so if a, a student had a, an issue with child care, you can see in this reference guide are a ton of different kinds of resources that have been put together at this institution to try to deal with it. So each advisor or coach doesn't have to come up with these on their own. They can go in and look and say, okay, here are the 15 different things that we know that we could do around child or adult care. Which ones might work for this student in this situation? And they begin to build out an, uh, a list or a plan of action for the student to be able to take away uh, in paper, email, and then they'll see it on their portal. So once they've done that as an advisor, you can see here in the SSP student interface that the student would see this task list out on the right. Here are the things you need to do, and are they complete or not? On the left, they can also search for things on their own. They can contact their coach, look at their academic plan, um, or go through the self-help guides. Oops. So if they search for resources, once you've gone to the trouble of putting all these referrals and resources into the system, how can we leverage that to get to you to the scale so that you can uh, support your entire student population and not just the ones that are targeted for uh, interventions or really at risk or special populations? And so this tool allows us to take those uh, interventions and make them available. So you can go out and search and you can meta tag them. So baby for child care or car for transportation. So they can search on keywords that are comfortable with and then still find the resources the way you might talk about them at your institution. And you can see here, so for each one, accepting financial aid, substance abuse, financial, um, applying books, child care, et cetera, they could detail into each one of those and see all the things that are available at the college or in the community to be able to assist the students with those challenges. They can then create their own task list if they would like, and if they're authenticated, it will save it for them so that they can track their own progress. So this way you can uh, teach students to do this in orientation or like a student success course so that they know that there are uh, places to go to be able to look up what uh, referrals for challenges they may face, or in some cases for how to achieve the opportunities they want. It doesn't have to all be about remediation. It can also be about uh, enhancing success. So this is just an example that once you detailed into child care, you would get a description of each of them. And if they hit the little plus arrow, it would add it to their task list and it would be on their list for them to use. So you can customize this email and uh, the template to print out. This is the most simplistic version of it in the system. But it gives them an idea. It reminds them of their goals, their strengths, the specific challenge they indicated, and what steps they need to take to overcome it and the due dates so that they have a, a, a very specific plan of action to move forward. And of course, you can make that look like whatever you need for your institution. So from an academic advising perspective um, for SSP, it's really about how do we know what they need to do. And when I say we, I mean the institution, not just the advisor. How do the students know what they need to do and how do, they, how do we know they've done it? The other thing is creating pathways through the curriculum so that we can make this process less painful for both advising and students and faculty uh, to make sure that we're collaborating and being able to build out good pathways so that students have less choice. And I 
mean that in a bad way. I just mean instead of a thousand options, they have 10 options that are really good and have been curated by advising and faculty working together to know that this is, these are really good combinations that lead to success. So map is a tool within the system. It's just another uh, click there. And it lists all of the courses available at the institution on the left. And you can filter those by the program or by course tags. You can come up with as many as you like. You can filter by term and availability. So only show me the things that are available spring 15. Then uh, out to the right, you just simply drag and drop the course from the left to the right to put it in the appropriate term to build out a plan for the student. Now, building these all by hand one at a time would probably take uh, more effort than some advisors would, would love. So you can load a template and have pre-built templates for all of your programs or the most popular programs. Uh, and advisors can also have their own personal templates. So you have different tiers. So this is an institutionally blessed template for accounting. And then an advisor might have a, a local template they can save as well. But that would bring in all the courses with all the electives and all the comments and context for all of that in one shot, and then you could just modify it slightly. So instead of building from scratch, you would be working from a known good state and then just modifying it to fit the student's life the best. So at Sinclair, they've done this for all full-time um, and all part-time programs. So they did these templates for 180 programs. So... Uh, well over 350 individual templates. Uh, and it sounds worse than it is because what they do is they, they built them out once and it took time. But now as each time the curriculum changes, advising and the faculty sit down and they revise that template kind of on an ongoing basis so they don't come out of sync. And so they are now part of the curriculum process or that are notified once curriculum is finished uh, that they need to sit down with the faculty and make sure that they understand how it should work and, and update the templates appropriately. So this is just a, an example of filtering down to specific courses or templates. Um, with each course, you have the ability to make a comment that other advisors and coaches can see and a comment that students can see. You can also mark this as an important course. For example, like if the course is only offered every fall uh, and letting them know that if you miss this opportunity, you really are uh, putting yourself at risk. You can also set what kind of elective it is. Is this a program elective? of a genetic elective, or is it a requirement for your program? This can all also be brought in with the template. So you can see there at the top, the advisor coach note, this could have been done during that consultative session between faculty and advising where they put in the context and the notes. Why would I ask the student to take SOCH versus psych? Both work for the degree requirements, but here is a good reason. Now, we still want the students to have choice. We just want them to be better informed consumers. And we want the advisors, especially if they're doing generalist advising with you know, hundreds of programs to have some kind of context as to why the faculty or chair or the program lead would want specific combinations so they can inform the student. Now, the student could still choose to take psych versus SOCH. That's great. But we just want to make sure that we do that uh, collaboratively with them and make sure they have all the information. So back to that earlier point, I said that the coaches and advisors really let us know that Hunting for data and clicking through screens was something that they didn't love. So across the top here, we have added a few buttons that are a bit duplicative. So you can pop up the financial aid button as a little window that comes up to give you information about that or the student transcript uh, and the ability to calculate if they're on or off plan there. Uh, again, these are things that you could get from other places in the application. But the idea was is they wanted to see it immediately while they were working on the map and not leave that screen and have to save it. So they just wanted information so they could make sure that what they were doing uh, would be okay for the student's completion rate or satisfactory academic progress or fit within the, the confines of the transcript. So how does that look from a student perspective on how they see their academic plan? So this is an API example. This is not uh, something that's in the open source software per se. This is an example of the uPortal 4 uh, framework pulling information from the student success plan via API and displaying it in the portal. Uh, but you can see there that what we've done is just pulled forward the student's uh, map, let them know the course, the title, the credit hours, if it's awarded or not, and again, those notes that would have come across from the advisor to let them know that, you know, you need to do this in fall or 
uh, make sure you get your books two weeks in advance. This faculty member expects you to have an assignment done on the first day, whatever it might be that you're trying to communicate to them. Uh, and, and in the past, advisors, you know, they love to write notes and they write them on pieces of paper, but we wanted to capture that value instead of it just going out of the office in the hands of the student. This is another example of an API use, um, but, but pretty easy to set up and used by a, a number of other schools where when they go to uh, register, we can let them if they know if they're on or off plan and ask them to contact an advisor immediately if they're off plan or if they haven't been making progress. We also do a similar kind of thing when they go to submit registration, and it would say you're trying to register for two or three classes that you are uh, not advised to take. Are you sure you really want to do this? Then that can be tracked in the database and the coaches can then search on all their students that are off plan and be able to try to be more proactive about finding out why did you decide not to do this or, you know, have you considered the financial aid impacts, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess the idea here, though, is to use the data that the moment the student is trying to make the decision. So as they log into our registration system, we let them know that if they're on off plan and if they are, they should contact their advisor. And when they go to actually register that final step, we say, hey, what you've suggested does not match what we've advised. Are you sure you really want to do this? Now, again, we try to treat them as adults, and they have choice, and they can do what they'd like to do, but we just want them to be aware that there could be impacts. Another API example would be to um, involve your faculty more by showing them the maps on their roster. Uh, and Sinclair had been doing this for a number of years, and so you can see there for each student that has a map, there's a little icon, and if they're on or off plan, and then the faculty member can actually drill through, see the student's map, and find the advisor. This helps cut down on questions like, you know, the faculty member says something like, who on earth told you to do this? And the student says, well, the brown-haired lady in advising told me. And the faculty member just shrugs and, you know, is just concerned that advising doesn't know what faculty's doing, et cetera. Now faculty can actually go through, look at the program, and if they have questions or concerns, immediately from the system, email to the advisor and say, hey, what's going on here? Or this looks great, or, or whatever it might be. But again, trying to make that connection between faculty, advisor, and student and get those loops closed. Um, what makes a student successful shouldn't be a secret. We should all be working together to help that student move forward. So all of this... Um, is really helpful and it helps to put a framework around a tactical operation. But in the end, we need to know that any of this stuff actually worked. Does having a map make a difference? Uh, does doing early alerts make a difference? If we put the resources into this and we have the tutoring center and we extend the hours, does it matter? And so the reporting and measurement becomes pretty critical. The ability to tag and track things in, in SSP is, is quite powerful. So we know that what interventions were taken. Did the student complete those interventions or not? Um, we know what kind of early alerts were sent. So we could start looking for patterns of, do we get the same kind of early alerts from specific types of courses? Do we get more alerts from math courses or English courses? Are they more for uh, attendance or academic issues, low test scores, test anxiety, et cetera? So we can start to change our programming or, or shift our policies to, to better meet our students' needs. So there are a number of reports baked into the system, and then obviously you can go in and do anything you would like with the data directly, and we have a, a pretty well-documented uh, data integration plan so that you can see the data, uh, and you can obviously get to it directly if you would like. Use whatever reporting packages you may have or statistical analysis packages. This is an example of just early alert case counts, how many were open, how many students that represents, how many have been responded to, so you can try to keep up on, or, you know, the faculty are sending these, are we actually responding to them, are they getting closed, um, what is the success rates, et cetera. So moving on to more of a, a back-end functional thing, um, so we've talked a lot about how the users of the system I would interact with it and the use case and why would you do this. But from a background, and one of the things I think the, the SSP team is proud of is that we have moved as much stuff into the administrative UI as possible so that you can do many more things without having to go in and, and uh, recompile the code or open up your IDE and make a change. And so on the left there is the, the set of trees for all the different configuration options that are available in the UI. Uh, and then the one I've pulled up here is... Um, the configuration options, and there are multiple pages, I believe we're up to about 80 system options. 
that are now configurable, including things like where the default emails go or whether the timeouts or what are the URLs or specific port numbers or OAuth uh, strings, et cetera, so that you can set all these things straight from the UI uh, without having to go in and touch the code, which is really neat. Now, more tactical from a user perspective, the message templates are all here, so you can modify all the things that go out for the different automated systems messages, emails, uh, things of that nature, uh, without having to go in and, and touch a specific file and, and open it that way. You can change um, a number of labels and things in the system. So those tabs you saw for the entire student intake and all the labels and all dropdowns are all configurable. So you can change it quite a lot, actually, uh, to make it configurable and, and useful for your institution. So this is an example of the LTI uh, integration, and you can see that we've put that in the UI as well so that you can do a straight LTI. And this was done for the early alert, but could be used for other pieces as well. There's also an OAuth 2 client directly built in so that uh, you can direct, uh, connect this to other systems, and then also the ability to very granularly select which piece of the API that that client can talk to. So you can limit the security uh, risks to say that this is a read-only access to a specific part of the, the data set versus an entirely open API. Uh, and this is nice, again, because you're not doing this in code, and it, uh, it can be done much more quickly so that you can integrate with more systems, uh, particularly to get common authentication between portals and the student uh, system or between the LMS and the system, et cetera, for deep links, things like that. So we've added all those success indicators on the front page, and we've also made sure to add those to the administrative tool here. So you can see that there are different kinds of uh, intake areas then we can uh, give them a name, and then as they go in, you can see here we can put in the different scales, and then we can put in the risk levels and then set the scales to be different. So you can do it very granularly, you know, 0 to 2.49 is low, 2.5 to 2.99 is high or is medium, 3 to 4 is high for this specific uh, GPA. Or if you wanted that to be different, you can totally set it different, and then that will set it up to be the red, yellow, green. Again, all from the administrative interface, using the data from the integration instead of writing specific uh, rules or without doing any kind of programming. So over the years, we've been fortunate enough to receive a, a number of accolades and, and stay relevant, so we're excited about that. Um, we have a, a fairly large ecosystem of, of partners. Sinclair was the, the prime um, taking a grant from the Next Generation Learning Challenges through Educause with the prime funding come from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Since that time, the investment from Title III through the Department of Ed from Sinclair has, has ramped up quite a lot as well. Uh, we have a strong commercial partnership with Unicon. I actually just uh, returned from Denver, where uh, I spent some time in the booth with those folks uh, promoting SSP. And they have um, well over a dozen customers at this point with uh, on support contracts at Unicon. And they've done... Uh, many implementations and integrations successfully. We also have some nonprofit uh, partners in Data College who help people with process things, uh, trying to figure out how to change culture, why should I use this tool, instead of the mechanical or the, the, the technical pieces that Unicon excels at. We also have a partnership with PAR, which is where I'm at now, um, for the data analytics piece. And so we were working toward this over the last year to, to bring those different kinds of uh, dashboard indicators here so that we can look at uh, student data, make predictions, but then surface it in meaningful ways. So the software is, of course, open source uh, under Apache 2 and through Aperio uh, and free for your use. Uh, if you'd like more information about IPASS, uh, I've got a number of sites here, and, and I don't know if Ian will make these slides available or not, but uh, if he doesn't, feel free to email me, and I will make them available to you. And uh, I've got some links and things here if you just want to read some more, and there's some readiness guides uh, and, and things like, you know, what kinds of things do I need to think about or have discussions with faculty and administration about before I would undertake a planning or implementing a system of this, this type. So with that, I will be happy to take questions. Hey, Russ, this is Neil. Hey, Neil. Hey. So my question is, 
what kind of experiences have you had in terms of the change in process and roles and staffing at institutions that adopt a student success plan? So there are a couple different models that people use. Some people tiptoe in and they use SSP for very one very specific thing. We have a grant to do early alert. Uh, that's all we want to do. <laughs> and, and in some of those cases, you see uh, fairly modest changes in processes or, or staffing levels. Other places have taken a more um, holistic or strategic approach and have uh, really come to SSP after they were already thinking about how they were going to change their uh, staffing or their, their loading, and then they're desperate for a tool to be able to support that. Um, and I think that's where you see much more cultural change. I would say that cultural change is critical to make a tool like this really successful. If, if you think it's going to be a bolt-on, I'm going to give you a tool and retention is going to go up 5%, that's probably an unrealistic expectation. It's, um, it's a catalyst because it's going to force people to have a lot of conversations and questions are going to get asked and people are going to have to work out business processes and uh, handoffs and transitions and, and it may force departments that don't traditionally talk to talk. And you will also have to set up some kind of shared governance model, um, particularly where we cross academic and student support services. That's always been kind of a, uh, a line in a lot of campuses, not, not everywhere, but how do we make decisions so that as we do things in the system that it supports all departments. And, and sometimes that piece is missing when we've gone to institutions and they've had to kind of create that. And, and that takes a lot of different forms, right? Maybe it's just a committee or maybe it's, uh, you know, somebody gets appointed as the SSP czar or the IPAS czar or whatever you want to call it. Um, but typically we see transformation with these kinds of systems. Uh, people start putting them in and then they realize the power that they have at their fingertips and things start to change and then it kind of snowballs. I'm not sure if that was specifically what you were after, but but I think you would see transition and transformation. Yeah, that's that's the kind of thing I was looking for. Thanks. Yeah, and this is Dennis, and thank you very much. This is a wonderful presentation here. Very good. Um, and then you mentioned a name that maybe I should contact to share my experiences with the AWS. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you shoot me an email there at russ at studentsuccessplan.org, I'll make sure we get that taken care of. One of the, the slides I didn't get up was for the wiki, um, and, and we're pretty proud of our, our documentation for the wiki. We feel like we've done a, a pretty good job of making this a, an open source application that is pretty accessible by folks because we've, we've tried to document everything we could. Um, and so definitely I would love to have that feedback if you had an experience with the the instance that was not uh, positive, so I want to make sure. And um, so just for the, the call, we have spun up a um, an EC2 instance, Amazon Cloud instance, and the idea being that we had a completely finished instance with all the data in it that you would be able to spin up and just log in and use the system without all of the compile and pulling things out of uh, get and, and setting up an environment, which can be a bit onerous at times. And so that is our one of our strategies moving forward so that people can have a quick win, be able to spin the system up, get people in, take a look, do an evaluation, see if this is something for them uh, before they spend a lot of IT and uh, resources trying to, to build a system of their own. I don't know that, that that instance would be a true production instance. We haven't seen anybody convert that that way. It's been more of a, a way to get into the system. And quite frankly, we spin those up as training instances so that when we go to a college and, and talk about training, that we have a clean place to work from. Some of the other things coming, um, 508 compliance. I talked about that a little bit earlier, but uh, that's taken a bigger uh, step forward, and I think it will be fully 508 compliant in very short order. And I know that there's some um, considerable investment coming in tying this back into uPortal 4 or any other uh, portal compliant portals uh, to be able to pull things like the task list, the the action plan, the map, uh, and other pieces forward into those portals more seamlessly and getting those back into the project. I, I talked about them from an API perspective, but being able to get those back into the project I think is going to happen in pretty short order as well. So other questions? Yeah, this is Neil again. I'm curious. Um, there's a lot of emerging standards with learning record stores and XAPI, X, X and how are you, uh, um, uh, you know, how are you following those types of standards and and uh, with your with your project? 
So uh, SSP actually predates most of those. Uh, like I said, we've been working on it since about 2002. And, you know, Experience API, 10 can, and some of those others are, are more recent uh, developments. Now, with that said, it's it's not important. I mean, it's very important that we we begin as a community to coalesce and and come around some of those standards and make sure that we're interacting in ways that are interoperable, uh, as well as uh, the ability to research longitudinally across institutions. Um, so PAR was was kind of our beginning point for that, and and their work is really around uh, common data definitions, uh, particularly around learners, um, not necessarily within the course or the actual learning, not like adaptive learning, but more, you know, what do we know about a learner, and if they pass this class, are they more likely to pass the next class, and coming up with those common data definitions, and so we've been looking at that for a while and trying to uh, steer in that direction, but they're not quote-unquote standards, and I think that's kind of one of the the challenges in this space is that people have taken standards and, and very tactically. Um, so things like experience API would be very interesting to us, uh, probably more as a consumer than a generator because our student uh, interface, we could, we could output to experience for how students use tools within the portal to know if they are interacting and trying to help themselves. But that's probably a, a small piece of this versus the, the um, advising coaching perspective and how that might work. Uh, where that might be more interesting to track, are the advisors using it, are the faculty members using it, et cetera, which we might be able to do with something like experience. I'm also part of the LAI group at Aperio, so the Learning Analytics Initiative, and, and following the work of the Learning Analytics Processor pretty carefully, and also looking at that from the perspective of standards. So these dashboard items that we've been bringing in um, very much want to connect to that work, so that as we begin to leverage the work of uh, the Open Analytics Initiative, um, the work that was done at Marist and Josh Barron and Sandeep. Um, we want to be able to harness that and bring it in in a way that is, is fairly transparent. That's also the reason we've made the move to LTI, to be able to do those integrations in something that's already a standard with the LMS community. So it's, it's not 100% coalesced, but we're certainly moving in that direction, and I think as the, the community matures around IPASS and learner management or uh, this whole space. Hopefully we'll see some more standards uh, get firmer and more broad uh, and less point tactical solutions so that we can kind of start adopting some of those as well. Thanks. Russ, that's fantastic. We're coming up to, uh, to the hour, so I think it's an appropriate point to stop. Um, thanks for a really great overview of Student Success Plan. Uh, this presentation will be on YouTube shortly. Uh, I'll make sure that you get a link to it. All right. Thank you. And, and folks, if you guys have input or, you know, we're always looking for partners and we really want to expand the community and, and uh, you know, kind of try to share the governance model. So let us know. I mean, if it's something you would be interested in taking on, uh, we'd love to support you.